Our final talk of the day is going to be about lightweight computational tree tracing, and it's going to be, going to be given by Martin Fadigan from the University of Kent. All right, thank you for the introduction, um, and I also want to thank you for the, for the keynote this morning in, in which we saw many mistakes uh, in programs and, and how much we need tools to, to find these mistakes and detect these mistakes. So detecting is one thing, but then locating where the mistake is in your code is something else. Um, so in the keynote you mentioned uh, someone at the bank who made a, a big mistake, lost a lot of money, um, and you, you, the take-home message of your talk was all they needed to do was control bad quotes, and then they would see <laughs> the intermediate computations. So what I'm talking about here today is, is the control back quote of Haskell. So what we want to see is the intermediate computations, what is actually going on in your program. Um, so one method to, to locate a defect in your code is called the algorithmic debugging method. So later on we will we'll look at an example uh, but it basically works by asking an oracle to, to judge some intermediate computations. Um, this method is particularly suitable to pure computations, like, like you have in Haskell uh, and, and other lazy functional languages. Um, and the data structure it works from is a computation tree. Um, and one of the things of of this method is it, it's around for some time, but, but it's not used that much. And one of the reasons is it's very hard to actually get such a computation tree. Um, and previous work constructed such a computation tree by either using a specialized runtime environment or transforming the whole program. And the biggest problem with this is that maintaining this is very hard, especially with a language like Haskell that is. You know, a lot of academics do things in Haskell and it's changing all the time. So when you take in practice a program that's not working, that has a defect, and you want to find where the defect is, then often you cannot use these tools. So what I'm talking today in my presentation is, is a very lightweight method that doesn't need maintains, but that's just a small library. Um, but first I'm going to show you a small example program with a defect, and then we're going to use the algorithmic debugging method to find the, de the defect in the code. Um, so let, let's put hands, who, who's familiar with Haskell in this room? Quite a few people, yeah. So who's not familiar with Haskell? Yeah, a few people. Um, so another question, do you know property-based testing? No, not so many people, okay. Yeah, so let's let's I, I'll quickly talk you through this program. So it, this program is 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 an, an, um, is telling you if a number is odd or not, and it's it's maybe yeah a bit of a strange implementation, but it's it's to show you how things work. So we have here four functions. So if the function is odd, and it gets a number n, and then it it says well we do the function plus one of n. And then we see if it if it's even, and we implemented the function is even by another function mod two, and I'm comparing of mod two of n is zero, and then we have here a, a function plus one, which is just then taking a number n and adding one, and then the function mod two of n, yeah, that's where we made a small mistake because we're actually doing divide of n by two. And then we have a little bit of whiteness, and then we define a property. So property is, it's a bit of a middle ground between the, the normal kind of testing you would do and uh, proving something formally. So what you, you do is you, you write a, a for all property. So we say for all x, the is odd of x should return uh, a result that is different from is odd of x plus 1, right? If, if 2 is odd, 3 cannot be also odd. Um, so what QuickCheck will do, this is a, a, a tool that will just generate a lot of values for x. And then 
if it finds some value for this for which this property doesn't hold, it will raise the problem to us and it tells us the count, for example. Another way wise it says, I, I've now tried very many values and the property holds for all of them, so probably you can trust the implementation. Um, but in this case, there's a defect, and, and Gripcheck actually very quickly finds us the number two uh, as a counter example. But now we only know that there is a problem in our program. We do not yet know where the problem is. And we might actually have multiple properties, but more than one can fail. Um, so maybe by reasoning about the program ourselves, we can find it out. But wouldn't it be nice if we had a tool that guided us to where the problem is? So that's where algorithm debugging comes in. So what it does, it, it recorded intermediate computations that are otherwise hidden from us. And it will show here the application of the function is odd to the value 2, producing the result value false. And asking the oracle, and the oracle can be, for example, a human programmer, it is asking us, is this what you intended, or is it not? So we say, is odd 2, should that be false? Well, we, we think that should be false, so then we say right. But then, is odd 3 is false? Well, we think that maybe should actually be true. So, so then we say, that, that is wrong. So the session continues and we give more answers and at some point it has enough information and it tells us, okay, now I know it, the defect is located in function mod 2. And then we go back to our code and we can look at the definition of mod 2 and fix the code. And I, I, I'm doing here at the level of, of functions, but you could actually go a little bit more fine-grained. Um, so how does algorithm, the algorithm debugger know which questions to ask and um, which conclusions to draw at the end. For this, it, it uses something called a computation tree. And here I've shown the computation tree of uh, computing the property with its counter example. So at the top you see an artificial root, and then below that you see computation statements, so a function applied to an argument and its result. And the ticks means that we answered right, and the process means that we answered no. And when we at some point find a note in our tree that is wrong, and that doesn't depend on anything else that is wrong, then the slice of the code associated with that note must contain a defect. Um, so the question is, how do we, in a lightweight method, uh, construct such a tree? And before I'm going to tell you that, we're first going to look at why is it actually so hard to <coughs> construct such a tree for a lazy evaluated language. So when we look at this computation, for example, is even applied to the expression plus one applied to three. And here the yellow box uh, is, is the definition of our functions. So what, what we do is, because, lazy, because uh, this is lazy evaluate, we are going to, to first evaluate is even. So we, we substitute is even with its body, which is mod 2 n equals 0. And then the n is plus 1, 3. Um, so we want mod 2 of n, we want to know what value that is. That means now we're going to evaluate mod 2 of n, which is diff n2, where n is still plus 1, 3. Okay, and now we're going to step out of this computation and jump to a completely different part of our code, because only now we're asking for the value of the expression n. Now we're going to actually evaluate the plus 1 applied to 3. And that gives us the value 4. And now we step back to the computation where we were. And we can compute now uh, 4 divided by 2 is 2, giving us the result value false. Right. 
So in, in the paper, I go into a bit more detail, and, and I have a semantics for you if, if you prefer looking at that. Um, so one way, um, this is approached that doesn't use a complete transformation is by value observation. Um, and this, this method uh, presented by Andy Gill, um, it, it, um, it's, it's very lightweight, it's just a library, um, and what it does, it, it observes intermediate values. So how, how does this work? This is our code with annotations in blue. The annotations, it's, it's very uh, straightforward where every function just has an observe with as a label uh, the name of the function. So you can imagine a, a compiler or some transformation pass doing this just for the code that you uh, suspect contains the defect. So libraries and things like that can just stay as they are. And then what, what these observations give is as a side effect, they record all these events. And these events say we request an expression and then at some point we have a value. And even though Haskell has many different kinds of expressions, it only has a, a select set of values. So that's why this library scales, because we only observe the values. So these, these events, numbered from 1 to 12 here, these events um, are, are kind of mixed up. And what, what we do is, for example, for the if is even one, that's only the, the red colored ones. We can, after the program terminated, we can combine them into a computation state. So we, we can do already this with uh, Andy Gill's approach. And this gives us a list of computation statements, which we can judge again. The problem is, we, we do not know how these um, computation statements are related. Because there's no relation, we cannot draw a conclusion. So how, how can we get the relation between these? Um, yeah, so we cannot directly use it for algorithmic debugging because the relation between these statements is unknown. Um, so the key insights, and, and if there's one slide to remember, then it's this slide. Um, the key insights uh, of our paper are that these traces that Andy Gill actually already has, and for which he only defined how to get computation statements, contain request events and response events. And a request event um, means I, I'm now going to evaluate this expression, and a response means I now have the value of this expression. And every request event responds to a response event. And together, these two events form a span. And from how these spans are nested, we can derive the relation between the computation statements, giving this a computation tree. So here on the left, I, I, I added some markers giving you um, these spans. And here in red, we see the result span of is even, and in blue, the result span of mod 2. And these illustrate our first rule, namely if a result span is directly nested into another result span, there's a relation between the two statements. So like this. There's, these are nested, so there's a dependency from the outermost span on the innermost span. Then the second rule, there are also argument spans in, in the lighter colored blue. So you would think that maybe uh, span 5.8 would be directly nested in the result span 2.11. However, because there's a, the span 3.10 in between, we, we see that the uh, um, Computations of the 211 span are suspended, so to say. So we are actually nested in the span outside of that. All right. 
So we implemented these uh, rules in a uh, debugger called put pure. And we uh, used our debugger to construct computation trees for uh, a pretty printing library, uh, a window manager, and a video game. Um, and um, there's actually a website where you can find some more examples. Um, and I think I have time, so I actually wanted to tell a nice story about the, the, the pretty printing library. So this, this library um, we actually use in the debugger itself to render the computation statements. And we started using this because the, the implementation of Andy Gill of rendering his computation statements was not efficient enough. And we discovered that when we were rendering some rather large computation statements for the video game. And then, then we switched to, to FPretty, which was much faster, but what it was not always printing statements as we expected it to be. So that was an excellent opportunity to, to try out debugger. And uh, so we actually located a real defect uh, in the FPretty library and um, well, I located it and my co-author Olaf Chitil is actually the maintainer of the FPretty library. So when I told him about the defect and um, submitted a patch, then, then actually a new version of FPretty, uh, the bug we found with our tool, uh, was fixed. Um, so what I've told you today is I've, I've given an, um, a practical method for constructing computation trees uh, in Haskell. So our method is simple, and because it's a simple implementation, it is, it is easy to maintain. And this is imported in a language like Haskell, Haskell that is continuously in flux. Um, our implementation works with any Haskell runtime system, um, and our ID works with any functional language. So even for a strict language, it, it might be worthwhile looking at this ID. So we get exact computation trees from these request response spans. Um, and we have we only make annotations in suspected codes. Um, what I didn't show you in the presentation, but what you can find in the paper, is how we exactly handle high order functions and data structures. All right, thank you. Question. Um, so I, I observed that the this interactive debugging, where the, the system interacts with the developer and helps them find problems, it really hasn't caught on. Um, do you have any thoughts about why that is the case? I mean, it, the idea has yeah. been around for many years, and yet somehow, for some reason, it hasn't caught on. Yeah, that is a very good question. Thank you. Yeah. So there's the problem is um, there are multiple problems. One problem is that programmers they don't like to be guided. Right? They prefer to be behind the steering wheel and decide which part of the program to look at. So that's one problem. And another problem is that um, the computation statements we ask we asked the, the, the program, they can become very big or we, we, we might need to answer uh, very many questions. Uh, so these, these are problems. And um, this is in fact something I'm, I'm looking at in my further work. So here, here we're looking at how do we get this computation tree and then we have a method of you know guided uh, defect location and what I'm now looking at is how can we actually answer these questions maybe without or with less interaction with the program. Um, so in the beginning I already talked a little bit about uh, property-based testing and what I would like to do is, if you have defined properties in, in many, for many parts of your program, that you can actually use these test properties to either answer questions or to give advice on how to answer these questions, um, or maybe discover from complex questions simpler questions. 
Thanks for the talk. I have a question which I suppose is more about algorithmic debugging rather than your particular contribution here. So I like the nice example you showed where you drilled down and found that there was a bug in the mod function. So when I program, I usually find that the bugs that are difficult to pin down and fix are due to interactions between two often quite distant parts of my program. And it may be that neither part is wrong in itself. It may just be that they both need to be changed. They're inconsistent with one another. Admittedly, this is almost always due to pointers and side effects, which is maybe because I don't program in a functional program. Yeah. I wonder whether this is a, something that algorithmic debugging, is this a limitation of algorithmic debugging? Or what would happen if you had a bug that was indeed due to basically two functions being incompatible with one another and them both needing to be changed? Right. Um, and what would the technique guide you towards? It, so, so algorithmic debugging finds one defect. So in, in, this, in the scenario de you described, you, there are actually two functions that are not working as they should. Right? They work differently than you have either specified, or at least in your mind you have some kind of specification. So what algorithmic debugging does, it will find one of them, then you fix that function according to the specification or the ID you have in your head, and then you run another session where you will find the other one. Okay. Right. Um, so what, what I showed here was how you um, can use the tree um, for algorithm debugging, but you can also imagine that you just browse the tree and, and look at how things are interacting to get an idea of what needs to be changed. So the algorithmic debugging method is a very helpful method that guides you exactly to where the problem is. But a computation tree on itself can be a very good tool to help you understand what is going on in your program. And, and then you can just browse it freely or search it. So you add annotations for your suspected code, you think things will go yes. wrong. Is there any way, like saying that, like, you can put an annotation on a function call which calls many other functions that you know some other function is defined correctly and you want to basically ignore its use in the computation tree? Yes, sir. So you, you only annotate functions you suspect. So any function. So in, in, in the example program, there were uh, a couple of functions like plus or equality, um, and, and then there might be other functions in libraries that you trust. So simply by not annotating the functions, they are excluded from the trace. Okay, so you, you just annotate all the functions you think would go wrong. Exactly, yes, yeah, yeah. And so my idea is that usually you're developing a couple of modules yourself, and then there are, are libraries like Prelude or other libraries that are well tested that you at least in first instance, are going to trust. Um, so I imagine doing a transformation on all libraries or all modules in your own project, uh, and, and those modules get traced. Thank you. So if I understand correctly, most of this work is about um, constructing the tree. And then once the tree is constructed, the key question seems to be, can you minimize the number of questions you need to ask to get to the can you effectively prune down a very large tree to close yes. the right point? So one thing that surprised me is I was kind of expecting, um, but you have all this information from all the properties that pass. They give you trees that you that are known good trees. And I thought you were going to say that you were going to take the information from these known good examples and prune down um, to help you more quickly get to an answer. For example, anything that appears in the known good tree is right by default that you don't ask the user. Um, did, did I miss something and you are doing something like that, or do you have ideas for how to more effectively prune the tree? Yes, yes, so let me go back to the... Yeah, so, so what you see here already is that so the left is off to is false, because that one is right, we, we don't, don't go any deeper in the tree. Um, right. Also, this is a very, uh, so I should say, algorithmic debugging is, is quite exhaustively researched. So what I did here is a very naive approach 
I just start from the top and start going down. But you can you can actually um, instead of doing that, you can pick notes such that you divide three into two equally big parts, and you instead of having uh, to answer n questions, you answer only log n questions. So that's a method to uh, so sort of divide and conquer. My yes, specific yes. question that I was wondering about, I don't know if this occurs in practice often, is in this case there's no sharing between the sub branches. But since the subtree on the left is all check marks all the way down without asking the user, um, if there's any sharing of nodes where something on the right points to something on the left, you know it's checked already. Is, is that yeah. true? So, um, so you can certainly do things, and, and especially because it's a it's a lazy language, you might actually have things where one statement is more complete than the other. So, subsuming of computation statements is something that you can do. Yes, it's actually it's not implemented in my debugger, but yes, it, it's a known technique, and you can do that. Yeah, okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, speaker.